babies, when they're born, do not have an overall sense of rhythm. This is one of my individual research topics at the moment, what we call the circadian rhythm, which is our biological clock, that we wake up when it gets light, we're usually more energetic in the morning, it starts to get less later on, and then usually we're ready for sleep. But we can only do that when we have an idea of light and dark. And of course, babies have been living in the dark for nine months. However, just this morning, when I was doing a quick Google, any good news, there was a new piece of research, not only describing the Caucasian rhythm, but actually saying that breast milk influences that rhythm in babies. Now, breast milk in the morning has got energy in it, when they tested evening breast milk, those energy contents had gone and they were sleep-inducing melatonin in the breast milk. Now, I think that is quite a remarkable marker of our small infants if they're able to be fed breast milk. But of course, it opens up huge questions. What happens when we have to express breast milk and they're not necessarily night and day? But this all undermines what I feel is such an important quality, and that is curiosity. Curiosity to look anything possible up on Google, even better go out and find it, go out and do it, go out and explore. And we don't want to end up in vegetative states where we just receive stuff from screens. And I think curiosity in young people and as particularly as shown by our two wonderful speakers, is a very important quality. And when babies start to crawl, what are they doing? They are exploring. They are curious. Should not be kept strapped in places and not have that chance to explore the world. Now, when I was doing my own research in Romania, which many of you will remember, there was a huge scandal around the orphanages of real, real neglect. And sometimes children were not fed for three days because corruption made the food disappear and they would not be cuddled, they would not be held. And in the research that followed on their brains, it found there were big, big gaps actually in their brain holes. And then neuroscientists realized that your brain is not just the biological fact you're born with, it's how you are nurtured and cared for. And nurture and care helps your brain to grow. Another little story that also has a sad element, but I want to turn it around for you, was I also did some work in, in some other orphanages in Kazakhstan. It's an amazing place to go, very rich, and a place with space. You had to drive or walk for miles and miles and then you might see a big herd of horses galloping across the landscape. It's one of these places that makes you breathe because there's so much open space there. Now I had this idea that one could teach teenagers just the whole idea of storytelling. And then in the orphanage they could tell bedtime stories to the little ones. And they were terribly keen. Yes, we know lots and lots of stories. Yes, can we do this? We want to do it. A group of 20 of them came along. And so I said, OK, let's share stories. And every story they told me was one they'd seen on television in a Disney version. And I just found that incredibly sad that their own amazing traditional stories hadn't been told to. So we all started doing a bit of research, we started to feed in ideas for storytelling, but at least introducing the idea that storytelling is something live, it's something interactive. And sometimes parents talk to me and say, yes, but actors do it much better, we get a CD. I thought, well, actually, no. There's no human personal element in that. Parents need to remember they know how to tell stories. And bedtime stories, that calming influence, helping the melatonin settle, is one of the best activities we can engage in. Having said
said that, I now discover, relatively recently, that there's an area in the brain that neuroscientists have discovered called the storytelling brain. I mean, how amazing is that? And apparently, they've done lots of research putting uh, receptors onto the skull and realizing that when people are involved in listening or telling stories, certain areas of the brain light up. And not only do they light up, but they also release dopamine, which we know is a happy chemical in the body. So that there is that soothing but engaging area of the brain that specifically links us to storytelling. So my thread of stories continues right through. Keeping on the theme of curiosity, I will just round up because I want to share with you a little bit about the story of me and my children when we went to live in the Malaysian jungle. I wanted to get away from the UK, away from the West, away from drama, drama. <laughs> what might I discover somewhere else? And we went to live in the rainforest in a tribal village for a year and a half. And very luckily, we were adopted into the tribe. And the older midwife came to me after we'd been there a few days and said, well, actually, you're my daughter. So after that, all the other relations fell into place. And I had people coming by my log boat up the river saying, oh, you're my cousin. <laughs> Can we have coffee? <laughs> but suddenly, the whole river had this network of my relatives. I've never had such a large, large extended family. The very important thing that I learned and that underpins now all my therapy, drama therapy, play therapy, therapeutic storytelling, whatever I do, was this ethos in the tribe. One, that nobody was competitive with anybody else. Everything was shared together to complete a task. Secondly, you never, ever saw them hit their children. Violence against children, and violence against humans, was just totally taboo. And on the very rare occurrence in that year and a half that somebody got cross, they immediately apologized for having lost some control. Thirdly, dance and trance and music were seen at the center of them keeping mental well-being, but also if anybody became ill, or if the whole community got maybe a bit down, a bit miserable, maybe it had been crop failure, maybe foreigners had invaded too much, whatever. So on a very regular basis, they would have these seances with stomper music, dance, and if it was going to be a very serious one, it would be trance as well. But sometimes it would just be dancing, singing, music for sheer enjoyment and group participation. But very interestingly, in, this shows how child-centered they are, and I think being child-centered is quite a focus for this conference for it, isn't it? That mothers and fathers both had to take responsibility for the newborn. So because when you go into trance, the, your head soul, which rests here, goes on a little journey to play with other head souls, it was felt that parents of newborns should not go into trance. So you've got this affirmation of the family unit by mother and father sharing the same rules, and also the parents being known by the name of the child, not the other way around. So, just to illustrate, uh, my oldest son was called Andy, but he wasn't called Andy there, he was called something else. I was called parent of Andy, or sometimes they wouldn't even say parent, they'd just call out Andy and I was supposed to respond. And by parents being known by the names of the children, how, um, again, it acted as something to bring the family unit together. So, when we're talking about a child-centered society, I think within that, we do have to think about the family.
family as a whole as well, and enable parents to help to achieve that, to find a way of some of our drama, theatre, dance, and so on, being inclusive for families as a whole, as well as obviously for the younger generation and the small children, and I'm delighted to see there's some children's workshops in the festival, that we need to address that as well. So there's a long way to go, but I think the important thing this conference acknowledges it's important. And I think by acknowledging it is important, it'll happen. Thank you. Thank you.